أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجري الفلك مسخر الرياح فالق الإسباح ديان الدين رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلقه وخاتم أنبيائه ورسله سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين السلام عليك سيدي ومولاي يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم أعهد إليكم يا بني آدم أن لا تعبدوا الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين وأن اعبدوني هذا صراط مستقيم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls and the enlightenment of the hearts and for the hastening of the reappearance of بقية الله الأعظم روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفدا Enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He is known as Tawus al Malaika. The peacock of the angels. He worshipped God for 6,000 years. He is known as the arch enemy of human beings. Satan, Shaitan, or the devil is seen by many people as the personification of evil and a source of wrongdoing and discomfort for many people around the world. Indeed, religions, whether Abrahamic or not, view shaitan as an evil entity, as a source of deception, an accursed creation of God. When you look at the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions and talks about shaitan in more than 70, 70 occasions, highlighting the importance of this particular subject and understanding what our religion says about it. At the same time, when you recite Surah Yaseen, Allah wa Taala states to you and I, "Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani Adam Allah ta'budu shaitan." Did I not tell you, O children of Adam, that you should not worship the shaitan? Tell me, how many around the world today worship Satan or the devil? 300,000. How do I know? You look and you investigate that there is a faith known as Yazidism. Many of them li live in northern Iraq. They say that the shaitan, or as we call him, Satan, is not the source of evil. Indeed, they claim it is human beings. They respect Iblis. They say Iblis should be respected. In other words, they uphold this particular creation. Whereas the Quran, of course, is not referring to these individuals. It's referring to a bigger phenomena. When you look at the subject of Satan, it occupies a prominent position in many different societies. Normally, for instance, people are referred to as the devil if they cause wrongdoings to occur human beings which are instrumental 
in the development and the occurring of evil. Sometimes even sports teams, like the famous soccer or football as we call it, team Manchester United, they're known as the Red Devils. They're given this particular acronym or title. Likewise, we find that people often refer to evil deeds and they explain it through the shaitan. Once a lady complained, she said that my husband keeps coming back late. She, he comes back late every single night. And so one day she decided to wear costumes or to buy a costume which resembled that of the devil with horns and a face which was scary. When he was returning back at night, she hid behind the tree. As soon as he was about to enter and come to the close to the house, she emerged in front of him. He looked at her, wasn't surprised. She said, I am the devil. Are you not afraid of me? He says, no, I'm not afraid of you. She says, why? I am the devil. I'm here to haunt you. He says, I'm not afraid of you because I've married your sister. <laughs> Meaning what? That sometimes the devil is, core, is the subject of mockery or humor. Whereas when you look at the subject, there is a relationship between this and the subject of death and barzakh. What is it? That after we discuss sakaratul maut, the painful last moments where the soul is extracted, we said there are a number of things that help. Remember that these are extracted from hadith. We mentioned the first thing and that was the respect to the parents. Remembering also that respect to the parents does not mean that if the parents are speaking to us and are commanding us to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do so. Of course, respect and honoring of the parents deserves what? Attention. Yet only if it doesn't contradict the commands and the laws of Allah. Number one. Number two, we mentioned that the father and the mother respect, deserve this respect. But what does it actually mean? One of the ways in which we respect our parents according to hadith is the following. That Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam He says, you need to know the rights of your father and your mother over you. So they said to him, Ya Rasulullah, what does my father have over me as a right? Rasulullah says, the first right that your father has over you is what? Is that you do not call him by his first name. But today, unfortunately, in Western society, it's become a norm. Why? They watch The Simpsons. And of course, Bart calls his father what? Homer, right? With no respect at all. Whereas the religion of Islam says you cannot call your father by your first name. You have to give your father this respect. Number two, you have to ensure that you do not walk in front of him. Walk either next to him or behind him. Number three, when you come to a gathering, to a majlis, anywhere, when you go to somebody's house, you should not sit before your father sits. In other words, allow your father to sit, then you sit down. And number four, you should not be a source of damnation for your father or mother. In other words, when he or she passes away, the community, the people should respect you for the fact that you are a beacon, a good example for your father. Not a source that they would say, what kind of a child had this particular man or woman brought up. Likewise for the mother. The Imma alayhim salam would say, as much as you try, for instance, Imam Zain al Abidin, in what? In Risalatul Hukuk, he speaks about the right of the mother. He says, Look at the mother. She goes through so much pain. She gives whatever she has. She stays up the night. She suffers with these contractual pains in giving birth. As much as you want to, you will never be able to be grateful to your mother for what she has done. Yet try and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to respect your mother in whatever way that you can. Respecting to parents is one thing. We said the other thing is salatul raham, enjoining good relations. That is described in hadith as a way in which we can lessen the pangs of death at time of the separation of the soul from the body. But at that time, there is something that will happen which is referred to as al-adilah. What is Adila? Adila is when some people will see shaitan 
in those moments, in those seconds, shaitan will be manifested before them. That's why the dua, which is referred to as dua ul adila, a dua that you and I are recommended to recite. If you ever have a few moments, go back to the book of dua and recite dua known as dua ul adila. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al adilati and al maut. Allah, I seek refuge in you from adila at the time of death. What is this adila? Adila is when an individual ya'dil, in other words, goes off from the right path by the temptations of the shaitan that comes before him and presents him or her with a cup of water. Because they're thirsty. They are desiring and yearning for something to quench their thirst. The famous story of Barsisa highlights this. This story is very well known, referred to in the Quran very briefly. Barsisa was a man who worshipped Allah for 70 years at the time of Bani Israel. He was very well known for an individual whose dua is accepted by Allah. So people would come to him. One day, two people came and said, O oh, Alim Barsisa, this is my, do my sister. She is mentally retarded. She's not well. We want to travel. We want to keep her with you. We know that you are trustworthy. Can you look after her? Barsisa said, yes, it's fine. In the room, she was in the corner. He was sitting in the other corner. 70 years he was worshipping Allah, but there was a problem. The worship of Allah that this man was practicing was superficial. You know the type of worship that sometimes we commit and perform? Salatul Fajr, two minutes to go, rocket turbo speed, back to sleep. Right? Or when it comes to our rituals or anything else, I just have to tick it. You know, Allah said it's wajib, let me just do it. It will be fine. I don't know why I do it. I don't seek any benefit from it, but I have to do it. This man's worship was like this. It's only on the surface. Shaitan comes to him. And because the worship was superficial, Shaitan has a way through. He comes and says, you know that young girl there, you've never been married all your life. She doesn't understand what's going on. You can do whatever you want and then God will forgive you. What does he do? He commits the vile act of fornication. She becomes pregnant. Shaitan comes to him and says, Ah, see, now you're in trouble, mate. You've got to do something. He says, What shall I do? He says, You know, kill her and say to her brothers that she died naturally. So he comes, he kills her and her unborn, buries her, and the brothers come back a while later. Where is our sister? This Barsisa says, She died naturally. Now shaitan, of course, hasn't, doesn't have friends. He is a being which is interested in whatever brings people to what? Towards Jahannam. So he goes and whispers to their brothers, no, no, this Barsisa killed your sister. You can find her in that particular grave. So they go, they dig the grave and they find what? Her sist their sister killed. Barsisa is arrested. He is sentenced to what? Execution. He is about to be executed. Shaitan comes to him in that moment, the time of Adila. He says to him, I can help you. But he says, how can you help me? The rope is around my neck. I'm going to die. Shaitan says, I can help you, but the only thing I want from you is to do sajda for me. But he says, I can't. The rope is about to be pulled. He said, all you have to do, Shaitan said to him, all you have to do is lower your head just like this. Barsisa lowers the head before shaitan, the rope is pulled, he loses dunya and akhirah. Which means what? Which means that we have to be in the position to understand the tricks and the methods of shaitan. Why? The Quran says, Inna shaitan lakum adu, fattakhiduhu aduwa. The number one enemy, my dear brothers and sisters, for you and I, is shaitan. Question. Do I know how shaitan works? Because I want to help myself at the time of death. If shaitan comes to me and asks me to obey him in that final difficult moment, I do not want to succumb to satanic temptations. Therefore, I want to know or believe in a position to be protecting myself from the satanic temptation. How do I do that? I need to study the strategy and the way the shaitan works. Because today, if you're in a battlefield, what do you do? You work out how your enemy is going to attack you. 
That's the only way in which you can strategically defeat your enemy. And if the enemy, and if the biggest obstacle we have towards seeking perfection and righteousness and spirituality is shaitan, then we have to know how the shaitan works. The Quran tells us that the shaitan is one of the jinn. And when the word jinn is mentioned, people freak out. Because jinn is a subject that interests some people and frightens others. Quran says, Kana min al jinni fa min amri rabbih. That he was one of the jinn. Who are the jinn? The Quran informs us about the jinn, what we need to know. Sometimes some of the youths are fascinated by the jinn. They come to sheikhs and sayyids and others. They say, Mawlana, can you tell us some jinn stories? We love to hear some jinn stories. Why? Because jinn are on the unseen. We are unable to see the jinn. The Quran says they are a reality. They have intelligence. They are intelligent beings. They are being created from smokeless fire. They are invisible. They can see us, but we can't see them. They don't have prophets. They follow our prophets. There are Christian jinns, Jew jinns and Salafi Wahhabi jinns. Even Shia and non-Shia jinns. They follow the paths of what? Of what some human beings follow. In other words, they will be held accountable on the day of judgment. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا ليعبدون. They have to also worship. They'll be held accountable on the day of judgment. We are told they were created in hadith. They were created before human beings. And shaitan was one of the jinn. The Quran tells us in Surah Al-Jinn, there's an entire chapter in the Quran known as Surah Al-Jinn, that the Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, was praying in a masjid today known as Masjid Al-Jinn. And all of a sudden, he could see and hear a clump of what? Of the jinn. And he was told that they were all listening to the recitation and the beautiful words of the Holy Quran. قَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا We have heard some beautiful recitation. This Quran has mesmerized us. Shaitan was one of the jinn created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet according to Amir al-Mu'mineen Nahj al balagha he worshipped Allah for 6,000 years. Yet what happened was, there was a severe examination that we all know the shaitan failed. And when Allah said to the angels, because shaitan was elevated to the rank of the angels, Allah knew his reality. But it was for you and I and the angels to discover who shaitan in reality was. He was elevated to the rank and the status of the angels. When Allah said to them, prostrate before Adam, of course, Iblis, known as Azazil in hadith, later on given the term shaitan, said no, I am created from fire and he is created from clay. Ana khayrun min. Khalaqtani min narin wa khalaqtahu min teen. A very unacceptable reasoning. How is it that a creation from fire is better than a creation from clay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, Now that you are an accursed, you are what? To be taken out. You're no longer in this particular position. Shaitan asked Allah for a number of things. He said, I want to live until the day of judgment. Allah said what? No. You can't live until the day of judgment. You can live to a day which is known as waqtul ma'loom. Ila yawm al waqtul ma'loom. According to our narrations, the yawm al waqtul ma'loom and Allah knows best is the day of the what? Of the reappearance of Sahib al Asr wa Zaman, Ajjal Allah Ta'ala Farajah al Sharif. And therefore, we are told Shaitan was given life until then. The other thing that Shaitan asked for was what? The ability to trick and to whisper upon human beings. And sometimes to appear in the form of human beings. Allah gave the Shaitan this question. In return, what did He give us to fight the Shaitan? He gave us one powerful ability, one amazing tool, an essential and emphatic weapon. What was that? Al isti'adha. Wa imma yanzaghannaka min ash-shaytani nazghun fasta'idh billah. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you want to defeat the shaitan, then you need to do what? You need to recite and say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim But the problem is what? Too often we recite it and nothing happens. Shaitan becomes stronger. Shaitan was able to influence us. The reason why when we recite istiada and the shaitan is still able to whisper and tempt us to do what he wants us to do is because we have not understood or grasped the meaning of istiada. What does a'udhu billahi min shaitan ar-rajim mean? I would like to draw your attention so that we can go away today understanding how we can use istiada to defeat the whims and the desires and the temptation of the shaitan so that we do not fall in the trap, God forbid, at the time of Adila, before our soul departs from this world. We are told that isti'adha has four principles. Please pay attention to this. It has four principles. al mustaid in other words, us. al mustaid bihi, the one whom we seek refuge in. al mustaid minhu, Shaitan, the one we seek protection from, and of course, Al Mustaid Lahu, the type and the technique and the method of the Shaitan. First of all, ourselves. We should never be arrogant to think that the Shaitan will not come to me. That's the first trap that we will fall. That indeed we may become weak sometimes. I remember a man once wrote a book about Shaitan, an entire book. He said, You know, I am the best person who knows about the Shaitan. I am the expert about the shaitan. Shaitan will never come to me. In his dream he saw shaitan. He said, I am the first to come to you because you're boasting about your book. And therefore this is a satanic temptation. In other words, we should never feel a sense of immunity. From what? From the shaitan. Sometimes shaitan comes to us through indirect ways. There is a famous story in the Quran mentioned twice. This is of Ashab al-Ras. كَذَّبَتْ قَبْلَهُمْ قَوْمَ نُوحٍ وَأَصْحَابُ الرَّسِّ وَثَمُودِ Allah says, who are Ashab al-Ras? Some of you may have never heard of Ashab al-Ras before. They are mentioned twice in the Quran. We are told in hadith that somebody came to Amir al-Mu'mineen وإمام المتقين the gateway towards the knowledge of Rasulullah and the city of knowledge. He asked him, Ya Ali, who are Ashab al-Ras? Amir al-Mu'mineen said, this is a question that no one after you will ask. Indeed, I will give you. My chest is full of knowledge. But people do not ask. He said, let me tell you who Ashab al-Ras are. They are a community who live in an area of Armenia or Azerbaijan in modern day world. They were around 6,000 individuals. And they used to have a river by the name of Ras. This river had sweet water. And in this place that they used to live, they used to exist what? They used to exist 12 small villages. In each village, they had a tree. And this tree, they planted the seeds of this tree from one major tree that they used to worship. They considered this tree an object of worship. So what happened was that Allah sent to them 30 prophets. How many? Three zero prophets. They rejected them, killed some of them, denied the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would have in every year an annual gathering where they would decorate the tree and they would come and slaughter animals for the sake of this tree. So they were tree worshippers, Ashab al Ras. We are told in hadith that one day a believer, a mu'min, who listened to the message of the prophets decided, he said, you know what? I'm going to go and chop this tree down. Khalas. I'm going to do that. He picked up his axe. He went towards the tree. On his way, shaitan came to him in the form of a human being. He said to him, What are you doing? He said, I'm going to go and chop this tree down. He said, Baba, leave this tree. You are so busy. You don't have time to do this. Leave it for others to do. Why do you have to do it? This believer said, no, I have to chop this tree down. Shaitan said to him, but look at how big it is. Look what will happen to you. People will come, may may kill you. This man said, no, I'm determined. Shaitan said, okay, how about this? If you go back to your house today, 
You can come back tomorrow and chop the tree down. But if you go back today, you'll find 10 gold coins under your mattress. Go back and see. And come back tomorrow and chop the tree. Deal? The man said, deal. He went back, he saw the 10 gold coins. He said, wow, you know what? I'll have the 10 gold coins and I'll chop the tree. Next morning, he woke up, he saw another 10 gold coins. He said, if I get 10 gold coins every day, then maybe I can become a bit wealthy. And you know, this tree is not going away. I'll gather more money and then what? And I will then destroy the tree. After a while, when he gathered enough money, he came to chop the tree. Shaitan stood next to him, in front of him, and said, where are you going? He said, to chop the tree. He said, never, you can't. And Shaitan was in the form of a human being, immediately stopped him, grabbed him, and placed him onto the ground. He overpowered him. This man was not able to defeat Shaitan. He asked, how is it that I'm unable to defeat the Shaitan? The answer was this, that at the beginning you were determined and you were sincere. The moment you started to look after materialism and worldly matters, the shaitan, what? Overcame you. Hence, we have to understand our shortcoming and our weakness. This is the first degree of isti'adah. The second is what? Al-musta'adu bihi. A'udhu billah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the absolute powerful being, the majestic Lord who will come to our assistance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ladina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those individuals whom the shaitan comes to them, إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ If you are associating yourself with the Almighty, Allah will help you to defeat the shaitan. In which way? الشيخ الأنصاري the author of many important books that are taught in these seminaries today, such as Makasib and others. One day, his wife was about to give birth. And he needed money to pay somebody to come to help her deliver the baby. They didn't have hospitals at that time. The only money he had was what? Hukuq al-Shar'iyya, khums money that he had collected. So he thought with himself, understand this. He said with himself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a bit of this money. I'm going to use it. And tomorrow I'll put it back. So I'm taking it as a loan. That's it. Then he thought with himself and said, you know, what happens if I die? And this money that I've taken, the hukuq which belongs to Allah and his representatives, I'm unable to return back. So I will not. That if a human being wants to give for the sake of God, I cling on to his or her hand and I make his or her hand very heavy, stuck to their pockets so that they would not give. I think I make them think 500 times. Tell me, why is it that we'll spend 30 or 40 dollars going out with our friends in restaurants or to the cinema very easily? We don't think about it. But when it comes for donations, we make 100 assumptions or calculations or what happens. It is a time which is, you know, difficult. It's recession. God knows, maybe I'll need it in the future. All these thoughts come to your mind. It's the shaitan that's making you think and put these obstacles between you and giving. Hence we find that once there was a king by the name of what? Parviz. He had a wife by the name of Shaheen. And this king Parviz was generous, but his wife unfortunately wasn't. So one day, King Parviz says that I wish the sailor, the fisherman, to present me with some fish. The fisherman presents him with a massive fish, a huge fish. King Parviz, who is generous, gives him, what? 4,000 gold coins for that fish. His wife, Shaheen, is sitting next to him. She looks at him and says, 4,000 gold coins for a meager fish? That's too much. Ask for a refund. Ask for it back. King Parviz says, I can't ask for it back. I've given it to him. Why? How can I ask for it back? She says, I know of an idea. Call him back and say, what is this fish? I wanted a male fish. If he says it's female, say, I don't want it. But if he says, it's, if he, she says it's a male, say, I wanted a female. So you'll get your 4,000 gold coins back. He called the fisherman, the sailor. The fisherman came to him. The King Parviz said to him, tell me, what is this fish, male or female? The man who is clever said, Oh, your majesty, 
This is a rare breed of fish. It's neither male or female. It's special. It's khantha as we have it in fiqh. You cannot distinguish. So the king was so happy, he gave him another 4,000. The wife is now burning. Now 8,000 gold coins. She's disappointed. This man walks away, the sailor. One gold coin falls onto the ground. One gold coin. So he's looking for it. He's desperate to find it. Queen Shaheen looks at the sailor and says, Surely you are miserly. You are stingy. You're a bakhil. You have 7,999 gold coins. And you're looking for one? He looks at her and says, Oh, your majesty, it's not the one gold coin that I'm looking for. It's the fact that this gold coin has a picture of my beloved king. I don't want anyone to step on it. King looks at him, gives him another 4,000. <laughs> Therefore, sometimes shaitan works to what? To keep us away from giving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, one of the methods of shaitan is to do what? Is to delay and to somehow place obstacles between the human being and good deeds. Especially prayers. That if we allow the shaitan to function, if we allow the shaitan to become one of several, the Quran tells us, you determine your relationship with the shaitan. Number one, the shaitan could be your brother. إِنَّ الْمُبَذِّرِينَ كَانُوا if you're too wasteful, shaitan will become your brother. Number one. Number two, you can make your shaitan your friend. You have a choice, my dear brothers and sisters. You can either remember Allah and make the habit of dhikrullah something that you often practice, or... Allah says, if you don't do so, he will make you a friend of the shaitan. Whomsoever forgets Allah, Allah says, I will appoint a shaitan for you who will become a qareen. What's a qareen? A close, intimate friend. So the shaitan, what is the role of the friend? The shaitan will come to you and whisper to you at all occasions, at difficulty or at ease. If you do not remember Allah and wash your heart, with the beautiful fragrance of the dhikr of the Almighty, then unfortunately you'll have what? You'll have the shaitan to be your... You'll have the shaitan to be what? Your friend. Likewise, the Quran says the highest degree is to worship the shaitan. Alam a'had ilaykum ya bani adama what is worshipping the shaitan? Worshipping the shaitan is being obedient to him. Man asgha li mutahaddithin faqad abadah. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, If you listen to a speaker, you are worshipping him or her. What does that mean? That means be careful who you listen to. Be careful out there, especially when it comes to non-Muslim population, to look at individuals as your role models. They may be the agents of the shaitan. Because the shaitan has what? The shaitan has agents from the humans and from the jinn. He has junood who are the humans as well as what? As well as the jinn. Hence what do we find? We find the need for us to recognize that the shaitan must not be obeyed. And that isti'adha is a powerful tool for you and I to be able to deflect the temptations of shaitan and satanic temptations. So at the time of Adila, what do we do? If we are in a position and are cognizant of the attempts and the ways of the shaitan, then we can defeat him. What else do we do at the time of death in order to avoid satanic temptations? Three other things that the narrations tell us. Please uh, pay attention to this. So that we can be stand gr our ground at the time where our soul departs from our body. So that if the shaitan comes between us and between our souls meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can defeat him. The other point is what? In hadith we are told, Tasbihat Fatimatu Zahra, Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayha, is of the greatest importance. If you have a habit to perform Tasbihat Fatimah Zahra, when? After the Fara'ev, 
after your prayers but also importantly before what before you go to sleep before what before you go to sleep we are told in narrations that there are shayateen who are responsible for making you miss fajr prayers there are shayateen who are responsible for making you forget the remembrance of god such as tasbihat fatima have you ever wondered what is waswas al khannas we recite in surah al nas and what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَاهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ In narrations we are told that shaitan gathered all the what? All his junood. And said who amongst you is الوسواس الخناس? Who amongst you is the وسواس الخناس? They respond back by saying that one of them said الوسواس الخناس is me. I am the one who makes people forget to seek istighfar at the time of dhanb, at the time of dif at the time of sinning. I make people, human beings, forget to seek tawbah, repentance, return back to Allah. Therefore, that's the slinking whisperer known as waswas al khannas. There are shayateen that, if we're not careful, they cause us to miss our prayers and to what celebrate through this missing, according to narrations. These shayateen celebrate when they see the human being not waking up for fajr prayers. One of the effective methods is to recite, to defeat the shaitan, is to recite what? Tasbihat Fatima to Zahra. That the Imam would say, we teach our children Tasbihat Fatima as much as we teach them Salah. 34 times Allahu Akbar, 33 times Alhamdulillah, and 33 times Subhanallah. See it, practice it, and see the difference. Likewise, we are told that mentioning and reciting the following dua Rabbana la tuzik qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahma innaka antal wahhab reciting this often helps to defeat satanic temptations at the time of death at the time of adila what is the other point the final point in ensuring that we protect ourselves we are told that adatu salati fi waqtiha Performing prayers in its rightful time. Inna salata kanat ala al mu'minina kitaban mawquta. Question. Sometimes people say, Am I ready for death? I want to ask myself, Can I face Allah? If I was to die tomorrow, will I be able to face Him? One of the scholars once said, If you want a litmus test of whether you are prepared to face Allah, then question yourself. Examine and scrutinize your soul. Are you happy when you come to time of salah? Or is it a burden? Or is salah something very heavy? Oh, I don't like it. I want to get it out of the way. If salah is disliked for you, then you do not wish to meet God. Then you hate death and you're absolutely frightened from the journey. Yet if you approach salah just like the Ahl al-Bayt would, just like the Prophet of Islam would say, Qurratu Aini as-salah. Arihna ya Bilal. He would say, Oh Bilal, make me comfortable by reciting the Adhan. I can never have enough of the Salah. How better it is to have beautiful supplication and communication with my Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order for my body to be cleansed. In salata tanha anil fahsha iwal munkar wala dhikrullahi akbar. Salah would be a magnificent tool to defeat the temptations of the shaitan and his whisperings we are told in hadith that if you pray in its rightful time as salatu fi waqtiha imam al sadiq would say examine our believers our followers in three matters and you'll see whether they are truly shia or not one of them is what keeping secrets secondly is when someone comes and asks them for help they help and thirdly when it comes to the time of prayers if they pray in its allocated time and one of the greatest lessons we learn from karbala is about salah my dear brothers and sisters that on the 10th of muharram in the heat of the battle when imam al hussein sees his companions one after the other going forward and not coming back and picture yourself if you're fighting with imam al hussein would you think about prayers 
Would you think about salah? Some of us are in the comfort of our own homes or we're out and about shopping and it's time for salah and we ignore it. All of us question is Imam al Hussein, what did he do in the heat of the battlefield? When someone said it's time for salah, he would say, Dhakarta salah, ja'alakallahu min al musalleen. You have remembered prayers. May Allah make you of those who establish prayers. Indeed, laqad hana waqtuha. Indeed, it is the time when the arrows were flying in and people were being killed. Some of the companions of Imam al Hussein would stand to de protect Imam whilst he and his family members and some of the other companions that had remained what? We're performing Salatul Khawf in the heat, in the middle of the battle itself. That if Imam Al Hussein is performing Salah at that crucial time, at that difficult time, is there an excuse for us to miss prayers? Is there an excuse for us to take prayers lightly? Can I stand to honor the sacrifice and the devotion and the ultimate form of submission of Sayyid Shuhada in Karbala whilst neglecting my prayers? When Imam al-Sadiq in his final moments would send a message to you and I, لَنْ يَنَالُ شَفَاعَتُنَا مَنْ اسْتَقَلَّ بِصَلَاتِهِ Whomsoever takes his prayers lightly will never attain our shafa'ah, our intercession, the Ahl al-Bayt, a clear and emphatic message. Hence Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam's one important lesson is look after your salah. Look after your prayers. Make Muharram a station of change. Re-examine your prayers and the way you perform it. Number one, jurisprudentially. Have you examined, subjected your prayers to somebody else, a scholar or anyone else, for instance, your parents? And have you asked them, am I praying correctly? Am I performing my wudu in the right way? Have, you, have we done so or not? All these are important ways in which we can honor the beautiful message of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, and there was one lady who epitomized the importance of Salah together with her brother and his companion, his Ahl al Bayt, and that was Sayyida Zainab. Radwanullahi ta'ala alayhi wa salamullahi ala ruhiha tahira. This great lady, the lady who indeed was a mountain of patience, she will indeed perform the prayers including Salatul Layl in that night, in that night after the massacre had taken place, in the night which is known as Shamul Gharib, she would hold the Salatul Layl while sitting down in a continuation of her many forms of sacrifice, in which way we are told that she had sons. Some narrations say that she had two sons by the name of Aun and Muhammad, that she was joined by them in Mecca, that they came forward and they said that we wish to sacrifice our lives. We wish to fight with our uncle Aba Abdullah al Hussein. That in us we have the blood of Ali and Ja'far al Tayyar. Sayyida Zainab on the 10th of Muharram gets these two sons of hers ready to go to the battlefield. They are there standing. The narration tells us that when they went to seek permission from Imam al Hussein, Imam would look at them. They were young. Some narrations tell us they were. 14 or 13 or maybe slightly younger Imam says no you're too young go back they go back to their mother Sayyida Zainab Sayyida Zainab comes she begs and pleads with Aba Abdullah to allow her sons to fight in the battlefield Imam al Hussein finally allows them they go together right next to each other to the battlefield they fight so courageously that Umar bin Sa'ad looks and says who are these two youngsters they are fighting like Ali ibn Abi Talib is in the battlefield they kill so many of the enemy combatants until they are surrounded and finally they are martyred Sayyida Zainab when she sees the body of Aun and Muhammad the two young sons the narrations tell us that she never wept she went inside her tent and she went into sajda and prostration she was thankful to Allah she said Ilahi oh my Lord I am grateful to you for allowing me to sacrifice my sons 
own and Muhammad. The narrations tell us that when she came back to Medina, she went to the house, she saw the empty beds of own and Muhammad. This is when she cried, this is when she wept. These were one amongst many of the children that had sacrificed their lives on the 10th of Muharram. One other one was Abdullah ibn al Hassan, who when Imam al Hussein was lying there all by himself, he was 11 years of age. This young Abdullah runs towards Imam al Hussein, Ammah, my uncle, who is it that's done this to you? He looks at Hussein, his body is full of arrows and stabs, is bleeding from top to bottom. He looks at him and says, Ammah, ya Hussein, who is it that's caused this injuries on you? Imam al Hussein hugs him at that moment. Harmala looks at Abdullah, the young son of Imam al Hassan al Mujtaba, directs an arrow towards him and severs his right arm. Abdullah cries, Oh Ammah, laqad qata'u yameeni. They have severed my right arm. Imam al Hussein hugs him, says to him, be patient for you are going to paradise look at how the patience of Imam al Hussein he sees his own nephew next to him being killed in this most tragic of ways and another man comes and directs an arrow to the heart of this young child he is slaughtered next to Aba Abdullah al Hussein and he meets his Lord وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم العز الأجل الأكبر اللهم اغفر لنا ولأولادنا الذين يتبعون الله بإحسان وإلى جميع الأولاد وأولادنا 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 الذين يتبعون الله بإحسان وإلى جميع ال